tend to be where the light and darkness meet on the edge of the horizon through the trees i am a narcissist crippled with self-doubt i've got a courage that brings me to my knees hello hi and howdy how's everybody doing today i certainly hope everyone's doing well if you're new here welcome my name is jenny it's very nice to meet you. If you are a return visitor, as always, welcome back. If you get anything out of this content, please take a moment to like, subscribe, and leave me a comment with your thoughts. If you have a case suggestion, please email it to me at jenny, period, elisa, period, discusses at gmail.com. Today's story is a suggestion from Christy Cavallo. I hope I said that right. And Christy, if you see this, thank you so much for the suggestion. Y'all, before I get into this, I want to add a disclaimer. Uh, many of the specifics of this case is going to leave most of you, well, me anyway, very angry, confused, heartbroken, and sick. This is one of the worst ones that I've covered so far, so please continue with caution. I also want to add that when I do these stories, I like to add pictures of the victim because it is their stories. I just feel their faces should be seen, but in this story, there's only one photo of this baby boy alive, one. And it's not a happy photo of him playing. It's a photo that was taken at the ER. Um, kind of like the Brianna Lopez story, if you remember back. She had no photos other than the one that the investigator photoshopped from an autopsy photo. And it's not illegal to not photograph your children. But unless you are in a religion that doesn't permit it, or you don't believe in photography, in my honest opinion... Caretakers that never photographed their children just speaks volumes. The only photo of this baby that was taken, however, he looks so frightened. And I just wanted to add that as a warning, but now let's jump in. Terrell Peterson was born on the 1st of March in 1992. He was born in Atlanta, Georgia. His mother's name was Audrey Mitchell. Terrell had two half-siblings, Tasha and Tommy. Tommy was two years older than Terrell, and Tasha was seven years older than Terrell. Though I searched high and low, um, I found out that Tasha and Tommy's father's name was also Tommy Peterson, but I never found out who Terrell's father was. But Terrell was born with a Coke in the powder form in his blood. His mother was addicted to crack, and per the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, which is a newspaper, Terrell was described as a baby as always laughing and getting into everything and loving to blow spit bubbles. By 1995, the Fulton County Department of Children and Families had already received seven reports. The first report came in May of 1992 that his mother was doing substances while pregnant and that she was using food stamps and welfare checks to purchase these substances instead of feeding her children. In August of 1993, a caller reported the children's parents were locking them in a bedroom during the weekends and was denying them food and water. In February of 1994, a caller reported the mother is on substances and the children are left unsupervised. In January of 1995, a call reported that the children were begging neighbors for food and that the mother is using substances. In November of 1995, a caller reported that the mother is addicted to crack and, and that she leaves the children with their sickly maternal grandmother. Through all of these reports, no one was drug tested. No one was checked for criminal history. The children were not physically seen during all of the investigations, and the children remained in the home of their mother. The reports made were handled by 11 different caseworkers and overseen by 10 supervisors at the Georgia Department of Family and Children's Services. Due to the continuous calls to social services in early 1996, the, the social workers pressured the mother into signing over guardianship of the children to Terrell's half-siblings, Tasha and Tommy's paternal grandmother, Farina Shirley Peterson who was born on the 15th of October in 1947 and who at the time was 48 years old. Also living in the home were Farina's daughter, Terry Lynn Peterson, and Terry's boyfriend, Calvin Pittman. Now, according to the protocol, children that are taken into custody of the state should ideally be placed with blood relatives, 
receive at least one in-person visit with a caseworker each month and under no circumstances is corporal punishment to be administered by anyone who is fostering. Now, I will add that in an appeal filed on behalf of Terry Peterson, they were responsible for the discipline of Terrell, but I reckon the details of proper discipline and not proper discipline should have been thoroughly explained. Prior to Thanksgiving per Joanne Bryant, Terrell's Head Start teacher, she found Terrell rummaging through a garbage can looking for food. She said he would also steal food from teachers and she said that the Petersons told her to feed him less so he didn't defecate on the floor. And I could not find anywhere that she reported this prior to him losing his life, but am not saying that she did not. While no one knows for sure as clearly people were not doing their jobs. It is believed that within six months of Terrell, Tommy, and Tasha being turned over to Farina, CA became Terrell's life. On the 3rd of December in 1996, Child Services received a call that on Thanksgiving of 1996, now four-year-old Terrell was transported by ambulance to the Hughes Spalding Hospital. He was visiting his mother for the holiday and she noticed that he was covered in bruises. Atlanta police investigator A.C. Booker was dispatched to the hospital ER. The doctor informed Ms. Booker that this child is the victim of long-term CA. In the report written by Ms. Booker, she said, quote, I looked at little Terrell's body and most of the injuries were old. However, he had marks, scars, lacerations all about his body. His injuries included right forehead and ear badly scarred, a uh, marked path. His buttocks were swollen and tender, lower back marked, and left forearm, end quote. When she asked Terrell what happened to him, he told her that his grandmother, which he is speaking of, Farina, had beaten him with a belt and sometimes a shoe. He said that his last beating was for urinating in his clothes. The doctor also noted the injuries on Terrell and diagnosed him with battered child syndrome. In his notes, the doctor wrote that Terrell told him that his grandmother, again, meaning Farina, hit him with a white shoe and two belts in which he held up two little fingers to show him that he meant two. The police photographed the injuries on Terrell and released him to the custody of his mother and suggested she not return him to the custody of Farina. That night, Farina was charged with reckless conduct, which is a misdemeanor for the CA on Terrell. Farina was told to appear in court the following week on the 10th of December to face the charge. Farina told the investigators that she did not hurt Terrell. She claimed that he received the injuries from falling and fighting in school, and this was not investigated further by Terrell's caseworker, Cheryl. In fact, she never took the time to get the report from the officer. She never interviewed Terrell or his siblings. She never requested the medical records, and she never spoke to the Head Start teacher to ask if Terrell had been fighting or falling while at school. The caseworker assigned to the case of Terrell was Cheryl Elmore. She was also responsible for having Terrell in court on time. Unfortunately, Terrell never showed up for court because the victim Terrell wasn't in court to testify. The charge against Farina was dismissed by the court judge, Katherine E. Maliki. To avoid any trouble with her job for not having Terrell in court, Cheryl Elmore created a fraudulent, backdated internal memo and placed it in Terrell's file. In this memo, she reported that the trial occurred, but no evidence was found of any CA, and the result was the charge was dropped. She further added that Judge Maliki believed Farina and did not believe she was guilty of CA. Despite the medical evidence and the investigation by Ms. Booker, the police investigator, along with no court documents being attached, none of her supervisors ever questioned her. Due to this huge mistake, um, Terrell was deemed safe and returned to Farina. Peggy Peters, the director of the department, said of this error, quote, I can't speak for Miss Elmore, but I certainly would not have made this decision. On the 28th of December in 1996, Terrell returned to his Head Start program. His teacher, Ms. Bryant, noticed that Terrell wasn't walking normally. She asked him if he had been injured and he wouldn't respond. 
She took off his sneakers, and the flesh of the soles of both of his feet was burned off. It was alleged that this was done by Farina to punish him for telling the doctors and the investigator that she had beat him with two belts and a shoe. Terrell was again brought to Hughes Spalding Hospital. This time, Terrell had an infected third-degree burn to his left foot. Farina was ready with the story. She told the doctors a week prior, Terrell had stood on a space heater grate. She said she had tried um, treating the burns herself, but they became infected. He was admitted into the hospital, and a few days later, Terrell had to have a skin graft from his hip. Sadly, no one from the hospital reported this to law enforcement or to social services. Dr. Randall Alexander, director of the Center for CA at Morehouse School of Medicine said, the severity of the burn is not consistent with Peterson's explanation. The doctor should have raised questions about how it occurred, and I have a problem with this story. If it's going to be hot, you're going to jump off. And as fast as you can, a four-year-old is going to get off of it, end quote. Okay, here's where I'm sure many of us were waiting on this as we discuss this a lot on this channel, but Farina then took Terrell out of daycare. The only place that he wasn't tied up and he could eat nutritious meals was now a thing of the past. Time passed and child services did not investigate or check on Terrell at all. On the evening of the 15th of January in 1998, shortly after 10 p.m., Terry Lynn Peterson made a call to 911. She said that Terrell was not breathing. She claimed she found him having a seizure and biting his lower lip and that she told her boyfriend, Calvin Pittman, to call 911. She said that she performed CPR and mouth-to-mouth -mouth trying to save him. Terrell arrived once again at Hugh Spalding Children's Hospital. The doctors were fighting to restart his heart, and they noticed that he was covered in cuts, bruises, gaping puncture wounds, cigarette burns, and 45 minutes after arriving, Terrell, five years old, passed away. Later, Terry would tell the officers that she cooked Terrell fried chicken the day that he passed away, and that night she made him a snack of oatmeal, and this was just prior to him collapsing. The physician on staff contacted the police and said that Terrell displayed the worst symptoms of CA that he had ever seen. He suffered a recurring pattern of abrasions from the back of his head to the bottom of his feet, which indicated that a telephone cord and a dog collar were used to beat him as much as a year prior to him passing. Bruises and scars covered his little face in varying hues of purple depending on the age of the bruise. Ligature marks encircled his little wrists. He had swollen lips and lacerations to his mouth that appeared to be from being force-fed by someone very aggressively. Scarring present in his mouth showed it was not the first time. Detective Grippy was assigned to the case. He arrived at the hospital shortly after midnight. He observed Terrell's little body and noted numerous bruises, abrasions, and cuts covering his little head, his face, his torso, and his extremities. He then consulted with the medical personnel and formed the opinion that Terrell had been the victim of severe CA, neglect, strangulation, and starvation. He then talked to Terrell's Aunt Terry Lynn. She informed him there were two small children, ages six and 11 at the time, still present at the Peterson home. She said her boyfriend, Calvin Pittman, was at the house to watch them. Detective Griffey immediately went to the Peterson home. When he arrived, Detective Griffey made contact with, with two uniformed officers who informed them that Calvin had been taken to the station for questioning. The officers were watching the children Detective Griffey headed upstairs to ask the children who their closest relatives were to find someone to safely pick them up. When he made it to the top of the stairs, he noticed a pair of pantyhose on the banister in front of the bedroom, and several notes were attached to the door of the bedroom that the children were sleeping in. He read one of the notes, and it was titled, Terrell's List, Bad, and it stated, make sure he gets a bowl of oatmeal. For lunch, he gets grits, and dinner, he gets grits. His hands are always to be tied. He can't go to the bathroom by himself. He can't go to my room. 
Tasha's or Tommy's. Definitely not Terrell's. Make sure he gets plenty of water and he sleeps in the hall. When the detective entered the room the children were asleep in, he found one of the children ha having an asthma attack. With assistance from the other child, he retrieved a breathing machine from the other room. When the door was opened to the adjoining room, Detective Griffey noticed a belt and part of an extension cord that he felt could have been used to inflict part of the injuries on Terrell. When talking to the children, they told Detective Griffey the pantyhose were used to keep Terrell tied up. Detective Griffey had no success in finding family placement for Tasha and Tommy, so he arranged for court-ordered placement. He then called the police photographer to take photos of the pantyhose, the notes, belt, extension cord, and then he bagged them up and he seized them. DNA belonging to Terrell was found on the pantyhose, the belt, and the extension cord. An autopsy that was done on the remains of Terrell showed that he died from long-term CA. Near starvation had shrunk him down to 29 pounds. Following his passing, the welfare agency received reports that Terrell had, at times, been force-fed and dumped headfirst into the toilet. The medical examiner testified that it wasn't clear what finally took Terrell's life. He may have starved to death. It may have been a blow to his head or several blows to his head. He said it may have been a combination of all of it that had been inflicted on him. Terrell was buried on the 15th of January in the Mitchell Grove Baptist Church Cemetery. Not only did he live his little life lonely, no one showed up to his funeral and he was buried in an unmarked grave. Church members said that once he was buried, he was forgotten. However, hundreds of people called and wrote the paper wanting to know how to help. However, later, the attorney who, who will later file a lawsuit following Terrell losing his life, Don Keenan, purchased a headstone for him. And Christy that suggested the story said that it bothered her he did not have a stone, so Christy, he does now have a stone. Farina, Calvin, and Terry were each charged with felony, unaliving, aggravated assault, aggravated battery, and three counts of cruelty to a minor. The state of Georgia was seeking the death penalty for Farina and Terry, but not for Calvin. In questioning, Terry, Tasha, and Tommy told the detectives that the reason for the ligature marks on Terrell was that when he was bad, he was made to sleep on a pallet in the hallway, which he was tied up on. Terry further said that he was always bad. Terry said the reason he lacked body fat was he was only permitted to eat grits, rice, and oatmeal. Tasha was 16 years old by the time she testified in court, and her testimony was far worse than anyone could have imagined. She said that Terrell would only be able to wear underwear, and some days he would spend the entire day naked. He would spend his day tied to the stair banister with the pantyhose. He would either sleep standing up or tied onto a pallet in the hallway. She said that Terrell was often hit with an open hand or an extension cord. She said that her and Tommy were also both forced to, to hit Terrell also. She said they were not allowed to flush the toilet as that is where Terrell would eat. They made him eat feces. She said that they would pick him up and dunk his head into the toilet to make him eat it and if he balked at eating it, he would be slapped in his head until he ate it. She said other than human waste, all Tara was allowed to have was oatmeal, barley, rice, or water. She said that on Terrell's birthday, they baked him a cake, and everyone but Terrell ate it. He wasn't allowed to have any. It is believed that he was treated this way because he wasn't Farina's biological grandson, and she resented him for this, and she resented him as she felt he wasn't her responsibility to care for. And she could have very easily told um, social services that instead of taking him. So, bitch, that is not an excuse. At trial, the prosecutor made it clear that Tommy would not testify as he was so young and he was already traumatized by all that had happened. And in fact, in an appeal that was filed by Terry Peterson, she said that her sister Teresa from Miami, Florida, should have been called to testify as Teresa and her husband would testify to witnessing Terrell being beat on by Tasha and Tommy, who, per Tasha, they were forced to hit um, Terrell by Terry, 
And in my honest opinion, that is also abuse to Tasha and Tommy, as it is definitely psychological abuse. Well, this should come as no surprise. If you are coward enough to do these things to a child, you're certainly coward enough to blame another child. But Terry Lynn did, in fact, blame Tasha. She said that Tasha's entire testimony was untrue and that what happened was when she arrived home, she found Tasha beating on Terrell and the jury did not believe her. The physician that treated Terrell testified at the trial that he had not seen injuries to a child as bad as Terrell's before or since examining him. A psychotherapist who interviewed Tasha and Tommy the day after the passing of Terrell also testified and she testified that she believed the information provided by Tasha was accurate. During closing arguments, the state referred to the treatment of Terrell as torture. Terry Lynn claimed that the abuse to Terrell was done by her mother, Farina, and Terrell's siblings, Tasha and Tommy. She said she also suffered CA at the hands of her mother when growing up. She claimed she didn't report the CA of Terrell as she did not have any proper moral reference on such matters. And I don't believe anyone would not know that this is wrong. While there's no information on what the outcome of the case of Terry's boyfriend Calvin Pittman was, he is not listed on George's inmate site, Farina and Terry were both sentenced to spend the remainder of their lives in prison. Following the passing of Terrell Peterson, the State Division of Family and Children quietly began an internal investigation into whether or not Fulton caseworkers and staff had followed agency policies in the investigation of the abuse of Terrell. In a letter dated the 11th of February in 1998, Sarah Brownlee, who is the head of social services for the state of Georgia, informed the agency's top Fulton administrator Ralph Mitchell, that they had not. Only one of the first seven reports was handled properly. She further criticized the agency for failing to enforce safety plans for the children and for failing to investigate and verify what they were told. She also criticized the agency's response to the 1996 CA allegations that prompted the arrest of Farina Peterson. She said that there were several errors in policy and practice in this investigation. The caseworker on the case was Cheryl Elmore. She didn't take Terrell to court as she was supposed to do and the charges were dropped. Terrell could have been saved, but she failed to do her job. Not only did she not do her job, but she covered it up. She made a fraudulent backdated internal memo, which was placed in Terrell's file. This document stated the trial did occur and no evidence of CA was found, and the result was the charges being dropped. The memo stated the judge believed Ms. Peterson and did not feel that she was guilty. This was never questioned by her supervisors. Due to this error, Terrell was deemed safe, and again, his case was closed. The internal investigation found that a four-year-old whipped with a belt on the buttocks back and face had been seriously abused by an adult who was clearly out of control. The court record obtained after the child's death states that the case was dismissed because the victim failed to appear in court. Why wasn't the caseworker in court? Sarah Brownlee further wrote that her staff's review concluded that the Fulton Child Welfare Agency had failed its fundamental mandate to protect the child from any further harm. She directed Ralph Mitchell to outline within two weeks steps that he would take to prevent a similar tragedy. He later issued letters of reprimand to four staff members because the victim was not in court, but nobody was fired. Another group also met to review the case. This group of the child fatality review team included the medical examiner, district attorney, police, members of juvenile court, public health, and the Department of Children and Family. They also concluded Terrell's death could have definitely have been prevented. They called it a statewide failure involving the court, the child welfare agency, the police, and the hospital. However, when they had trouble keeping it quiet shortly after the indictments, someone had to speak up to the public. They gave a much different account of what happened. Ralph Mitchell issued a news release on the 3rd of June calling Terrell's death a tragic one, but one the agency could not have prevented. 
The release further stated that the investigations at the state and local levels concluded that the agency handled the child's case properly. A day later, however, Ralph Mitchell sent a memo to Peg Peters, who is the director of the State Division of Family and Children's Services, acknowledging what he had said in the press conference, and he acknowledged that it was false. He further said, fortunately, there have been no further calls from the media to follow up or contest the information contained in the statement. Later, Ralph Mitchell said that at first he did not remember how they had made the errors in the news release. Then he said he believed the caseworker had given false information. He said they based the release on what she told them, yet by then he'd received the state's review and it wasn't good. The agency had already officially responded by reprimanding the staff. Neither the state nor the county agency corrected the statement made by Ralph Mitchell. When asked why, they responded that would have been Ralph Mitchell's responsibility to do. Well, certainly somebody's and nobody did it. Due to the state of Georgia's privacy laws and to protect these caseworkers who didn't do their jobs, Terrell's records were sealed and inaccessible to the media rendering the cover-up undetectable. The cover-up came to light, however, when Don Keenan, the attorney that purchased the headstone for Terrell, received a case file by an anonymous individual that worked in the department. He said when he arrived at work at 5.30 a.m., he had two boxes sitting on his doorstep. He packed them into his car and headed to his mountain cabin to review them piece by piece. If that individual ever ceases, thank you for doing what was right instead of what the department told you to do. It was also brought to light that neither Cheryl Elmore, who failed to take Terrell to court and then created a fraudulent document stating that he was in court, nor Ralph Mitchell, who lied to the press, were fired. It was merely suggested that Ralph Mitchell retire with a pension. Don Keenan said the saddest moment was when he realized that if any one of the elements of the Kathy Joe law would have been implemented, his death could have been prevented. And for reference, the Kathy Joe law was named for Kathy Joe Taylor, who, like Terrell, was abandoned by his mother and left with a grandmother. Only in this case, it was her biological grandmother, and she was good to Kathy Joe and her sister. The grandmother thought she was doing right by letting DFCS know that she was now raising Kathy Jo and her little sister. They took both little girls away and put them into foster care. And she was moved around constantly, and at the age of nine years old, Kathy Jo was beaten so badly by a foster parent that she slipped into a coma. She remained in the coma um, on life support until she was 21 years old and she passed away. I do have her on the list to tell her story, and her story led to one of the biggest reforms of Georgia's foster care system in history. It requires four things of DFCS. The first is they must exhaust every possibility of placing a child with a blood relative. The second being foster parents cannot use corporal punishment. And the third being caseworkers must have monthly face-to-face -face visits with each child on their caseload. The fourth being following charges of abuse being filed, caseworkers have to appear in court with the child to justify the agency's actions and responses to the case. This was signed into law in Georgia in 1989 and has since been adopted by 47 states. However, in Terrell's case, literally none of it was followed. Don Keenan said that there were at least 15 relatives close by that could have taken in Terrell. Armed with this information, Don Keenan set out to fight Georgia DFCS. He decided the best way to fix Georgia's Child Protective Services system was to thump the state bureaucrats upside the head with a two by four in the form of litigation. Terrell's case was his club. Those are his words. And not only did he fight for Terrell, he did it pro bono on top of making sure Terrell had a headstone. So finally someone cared he was said to have a knack for making the jurors see things through the child's eyes. He took the state of Georgia to court and he won. He then pressed the Georgia legislator to, to pass a series of measures to protect foster children. The Terrell Peterson Act now gives doctors the authority to override police in deciding whether a child they believe to have been abused 
can be removed from parental custody and turned over to the State Department of Family and Children's Services until a court hearing, also known as Senate Bill 315. During the hearing, committee members were highly critical of the FACS and Department of Human Resources, which oversees the agency. Senator Kemp, the committee chairman, said that Georgia is doing very poorly at protecting its children from abuse and neglect. Terrell was one of more than 800 children who died between 1995 and 1998 after their cases were brought to the attention of the Georgia Department of Human Services or the Division of Family and Children's Services. Some were due to accidents and illness while others had their lives taken as Terrell did. Farina Peterson passed away on the 1st of May in 2023 and honestly, she was given a much nicer farewell than she deserved. Definitely much nicer than Terrell. A few left tribunes on her obituary saying that she was a sweet lady. Um, one lady said she would walk in pain to make sure her grandchildren got to school and no. Others, however, left not so kind tributes on her obituary. They defended Terrell and pointed out the evil that she did to him. She was buried on the 17th of May in 2023 in Miami, Florida. Terry Lynn Peterson, GDC number 00011291159, remains incarcerated at the Arendelle State Prison. Calvin Pittman, Terry's boyfriend at the time of Terrell's passing, as I mentioned, has no record of being imprisoned in Georgia, nor was I able to locate a sentencing report, so it looks like he may have got away with it. If he was an adult living in that home and did nothing to stop what was happening to Terrell, he certainly isn't innocent, in my opinion. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this brings us to the end of the tragic and heartbreaking story, along with the anchoring story of Terrell Peterson. And rest easy, Terrell. Rest easy, baby boy. You are free, and you will never be forgotten. I am so sorry for what you had to endure. If you get anything out of this content, please take a moment to like, subscribe, and leave me a comment with your thoughts. And if you have a story suggestion, please email it to me at Jenny, period, Elisa, period, discusses at gmail.com. And until the next video, toodles. I go to parties full of everyone I love so I can slip out the back door and be alone. Be alone. Left